Hello, welcome back. Uh, in this video, we'll be looking at remote access or remote shells. Okay. Uh, well, firstly, um, what shall we do? Well, uh, shell, uh, remote access allows execution of commands on the system. Okay. For example, we can create, modify, remove files and folders, uh, fetch data, uh, launch applications, uh, etc. Okay. Um, if you use some remote, uh, for example, your labs, your Azure labs are a remote access application where there is some other computer uh, somewhere. Um, where is the Azure cloud store? Somewhere in Australia, I think maybe Melbourne. Um, so there's a computer sitting there and it's allowing you to remotely log in to the computer and um, start the Windows uh, machine. And inside there, you can do stuff. Okay, so that's a remote access. Okay, and remote shell is doing uh, the shell commands remotely from the network. So your Azure one is a bit more unique because it provides you with the GUI. However, um, in many other applications, it will only uh, provide you with the shell. Um, you can think that as like the terminal or the command um, as well. Okay, um, but if you can access um, things remotely, that means attackers can potentially access them as well. So malicious users who gain access to the remote shell can conduct activities to damage the system. Okay, for example, they can wipe out all your files. Um, in normal circumstances, uh, the communication between the user and the server requires establishing a connection. So uh, that's typically done through a TCP connection. So we have seen the TCP connection before. And to create that connection, you also need to mutually agree on the socket. So socket is kind of like um, which, uh, which port are you going to be using to communicate because a uh, computer may have multiple different connections, right? And the way they uh, manage multiple connections is by assigning different sockets or the ports, okay? Sockets defines uh, which port to communicate through, okay? It's if the TCP IP is identifying the road to travel, socket is choosing the right garage, like this, okay? So if we have the whole roads, which is a, a connection, then uh, you may have like a different lanes or different garage ports and uh, or garage doors and those represent the port numbers okay so it will only allow you to pass in specific um, applications through that okay um, remote access uh, code is quite straightforward so here's an example of c code um, basically uh, as a server what's happening is you will probably sit idle um, until some something happens. So it's just gonna keep while one. So it just keeps keeps listening to the data. And uh, if we receive some bytes through that particular socket, uh, then we can do some stuff. And in this example, it's not going to do much. Um, uh, if I get uh, letter Q. Uh, it's just going to terminate connection. Otherwise, if I get some other stuff, I'm just going to say how many bytes have been received, okay? And then just echo back what those bytes were. Okay, so let's have a look at demo, yay. Okay, so here's my um, shell code stuff, okay? So I have the server, I have two different clients, and I have a third client that just sends the quit message, okay? So what I do is I start the server, Okay, so now the server is listening. I might reduce that a bit. Okay, and you will need two terminals uh, because that's two different entities. All right, so now I can execute, say, client. Okay, so what the client did was create a socket. So that means establishing the TCP connection. I connected to the server and then to send the data, okay? and then sent 13 bytes. So what the client code do is, it has some string. Uh, down here, there we go. That's the string that's being sent to the server. 
And as a server, it receives that packet. It says, hello, I'm Jin. So that should match that, right? So it received that and just echoed back. That was the server code that you've seen before. And um, same with client two. Client two is John. So John sent, sent 14 bytes. Uh, the server's still listening, okay? And finally, I can send a quit um, one. So this is the user who sends just Q at, for the server to quit or close the connections permanently. Okay, so that's the um, server, same code, Q is here. Uh, if I receive Q exit with error, so I just uh, error it out, so it just closed the whole thing. Okay, otherwise just keep listening um, and continue. All right, so that's the normal um, way of establishing connections and doing stuff. So I could create the server to do some more stuff. For instance, um, maybe I can create a server that calculates the uh, uh, Fibonacci sequence, for instance, and clients just provide a value. Um, then server will do that for me. Okay, stuff like that, right? But this one is just a simple example. Okay, so that's what the remote access is doing as normal, all right? So now, Let's look at two different ways of uh, gaining um, remote access. Uh, first one is the forward shell, where the client is hacking the server. And so that means client uh, is going to gain access on the server computer uh, remotely um, and maliciously. And then we have the reverse shell, server hacking the client. Okay, so that's the other way around. So let's have a look at the forward shell first. Okay, so forward shell, so Forward shell is the hackers disguised as clients can exploit the remote connection vulnerability. Okay, so if as a client you find some remote vulnerability in the server, then I can exploit that and gain access uh, on the server computer. Okay, uh, but for this to work, uh, we need to have the vulnerability existing on the server. That means either by discovery you found it or uh, you have to plant a vulnerability. Either way, it's very difficult to do so, okay? We'll have a look. But nevertheless, let's assume that we did have a vulnerability in the server, so now we can exploit it, okay? For example, uh, duplicate open file descriptor dupe2, okay? What this allows the client to do or the hacker to do is uh, duplicate um, uh, file descriptors. So file descriptors include uh, read-write, okay? So if if input and output descriptors are duplicated, then client can access the shell, okay? The system assigns the file descriptions sequentially. So duplicating an existing file descriptor immediately after our connection uh, to get the same file descriptor of the socket associated with the connection. I, yeah, I'm just reading um, because these explanations are pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> I wrote them. Uh, execute shell on the server and then uh, all the inputs and outputs will be redirected to the socket, um, which is to the shell, okay? So enough with the description, let's have a look at the code. Um, so let's have a look at the hacker's code, quite straightforward. Um, all we want to do is, uh, if I find, uh, if, I if I have found uh, the vulnerability, I can prepare the exploit uh, connection, uh, prepare for the command tra transmission, okay? And then we can send the commands uh, through this code, okay? And on the server side, the victim, we have this vulnerability, okay? This is duplicating, okay? Redirect all inputs and output to the socket, which is really bad, okay? But I purposely put it there so you know how it works, okay? I think I have a demo, yes. Okay, so that's the fourth shell. Let's have a look. So let's get rid of these guys. Why? Okay, again, uh, you need two terminals to um, simulate the attacker and the defender. Uh, wait, the victim and the target. Ugh, they're the same thing. Uh, the hacker and the victim. Okay, so we have uh, the victim as a server, I need to run victim first. So this is our server, it's listening. Okay, 
Now I'm going to run the hacker, the client code. Okay. So now I have um, executed the client, uh, the hacker code, which is the seen as the previous slide. Basically, now I have gained the input output. So I can say, uh, I can type my commands in here, okay, which shows you my current directory items here, okay. I can even look up um, uh, things like that. Um, and then it shows me stuff inside that make file. Okay. Um, I can even CD around. Okay. I've gone up a directory. And as you can see, uh, up it was our normal original um, stuff. And then I can like read stuff on there as well. Okay. Boom. Okay. So here I can read the server code again. And then whatever other bash commands you can think of, you can execute it, right? And you will have access as much as what the server has access. So if the server is running with a root privilege, that means you will also have a root privilege. Aha. So uh, privilege uh, is very important when you run stuff. Okay. Anyway, I'll just quit this. Okay. So that's how um, <clears throat> the Ford shell works. Okay. So as long as you find that vulnerability, then you can write the exploit code, just preparing the uh, transmission and then sending the command, then you can gain remote access. Um, but the, the shortcomings of the Ford shell is that this is quite easy to block, okay? Uh, we can easily create a user firewall um, that can filter out some malicious uh, users coming from different uh, places. Uh, we can also provide authentication to connections, uh, drop unknown connections, uh, block incoming TCP SYN packets from external network, um, allow, out, allow outgoing TCP packets from internal network, things like this. So there's a, quite a different ways that you can actually block. Okay? And as mentioned before, um, discovering that vulnerability or planting it is really difficult to do so. Okay? So this brings us to the next problem or the solution, right? Which is the reverse shell. Reverse shell allow your server to act as a malicious user. So now the server is the malicious person and the clients are the victim, okay? Server will lure clients to connect and uh, lure victims. The malicious server may distribute malicious code. So for example, um, online some um, like applications uh, may ask you to download it and run, right? Um, that could be one of these cases, right? If you run the applications, the applications may be already loaded with such vulnerabilities so the server uh, can hack you uh, through remote sh reverse shell, okay? Um, once the connection is established, the malicious server can now send commands, okay? So here you can see um, the vulnerable code, I'm just repeating, uh, the dupe. Um, whereas the hacker code, still the same uh, with similar uh, stuff like preparing the command, uh, sending the command, and redirecting all input outputs to socket. Okay? But it's just that the role has changed. Now the server is the hacker, uh, client uh, is the victim. Okay? And of course, I have reverse, reverse shell demo. So I'll get rid of these. Okay, so now um, the hacker is the server. I need to run the hacker first. Okay, so now my server is running, which is our malicious guy. And now our poor victim is trying to connect. Now it connected. And basically, the server can have access to the client now. So I can type, similar as before, I can navigate around uh, the file. I will have the same privilege as what um, the user has on. And typically, a user will have um, a lot of um, privileges to do stuff like creating files or making connections and so forth. And from, 
from the server, I can pretty much do all of that. Okay, so that uh, should give you an idea about the dangers of the reverse shell. Okay, um, the reverse shell is a little more tricky than the forward shell, um, but uh, it is much easier to craft. Um, for instance, all you have to do is distribute the malicious code who will uh, activate and, when, and once the uh, TCP handshake is made, then you are um, able to hack into those clients, uh, uh, client code, uh, client computers, okay? Um, so to prevent this, authentication may provide a certain degree of prevention, but because now it's the server exploiting, the client has to be careful whether to whether to trust the server or not. Okay, so from a client perspective, um, you should also have some other uh, mechanisms, things like malware detection to minimize the exposure to such vulnerabilities. So what they do is um, those malware detections uh, will also identify those uh, potential dangerous remote connections as uh, malicious code, and they can highlight that. Okay, so that's the end of this video. Hopefully you find found those items useful. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.